Pre-term labor is defined as the one where the labor starts before the 37 completed weeks of gestation. We can count it from the first day of LMP, that is last menstrual period. This is important because it causes lots of perinatal morbidity and mortality. The prevalence of preterm labor is around 5 to 10 percent. It is again divided into two. Early preterm labor means when the cervical dilatation is from 1 to 3 centimeters and late preterm labor or it is also called as established preterm labor where the dilatation is more than 3 centimeters. Respiratory distress syndrome that is the biggest disadvantage of this condition. Other disadvantages are intraventricular hemorrhage, fragile capillaries, very commonly seen intracerebral hemorrhages, intraventricular hemorrhages, which are quite detrimental for the baby's growth ahead. Hypothermia, because baby is just unable to maintain its body temperature and lands up in hypothermia when the baby is preterm. Heart failure, oliguria, anuria, baby is again prone for infections because immunity is little less. Jaundice because baby cannot just clear up the bilirubin load which a normal term baby can clear up. There can also be retinopathy of prematurity. So as this preterm baby has to fight with so many complications, we want to avoid preterm birth as much as possible. We want the pregnancy to reach at least 37 completed weeks. We all know the term gestation is 37 completed weeks. Normal duration of pregnancy is 40 weeks to 80 days, 9 months and 7 days. Till 37 weeks, if less than 37, we call it as preterm. From 37 to 40, it's considered as term. After 40 means once the baby crosses or the gestational age crosses, EDD, expected date of delivery, till 42 weeks we call it as prolonged pregnancy and then after 42 weeks it is called as post-term or post-maturity. Now we are concentrating on preterm where the birth is taking place before 37 completed weeks of gestation. Usually the symptoms would be patient would have pelvic pressure, backache, bleeding or vaginal discharge to begin with then this backache and minimum bleeding will get converted into regular uterine contractions at least one per every 10 minutes. Cervical dilatation will go on increasing. If it is more than 2 cm, we call it as preterm labor. There would be progressive effacement. 80% of the cervix would be effaced to label it as preterm labor. Length of the cervix would be less than 2.5 cm. So if you have a question or MCQ that what are the changes of preterm, you have to say all these things like dilatation, more than 2 cm, progressive effacement and decrease in the size of the cervical length. There would be funneling of the internal os. So all these findings on examination will tell us that this patient is likely to land up in preterm labor. What is the etiology? Preterm labor is multifactorial. 
There are many factors. We cannot blame just one factor. History. If there is history of previous preterm labor, then she is more prone. If there is history of previous abortions, she is more prone for preterm labor. Smoking, low socioeconomic status, poor nutritional status, working females, they are more prone to land up in preterm labor. You know vagina and the genital uh, urinary system, they are quite close to each other. So recurrent UTI, that infection can reach the genital tract, vaginitis, cervicitis, thus leading to uterine contractions. So recurrent UTI can be a cause for preterm labor. Genital tract infection itself because of bacterial vaginosis or beta hemolytic streptococci, chlamydia, mycoplasma, these are the organisms which cause preterm labor commonly. Other medical conditions related with obstetrics like eclampsia or abruption, premature rupture of membranes, polyhydramnus, multiple gestation, they can also lead to preterm labor. In multiple gestation and polyhydramnus, the uterine cavity is distended more and thus the pressure causes preterm labor. In eclampsia, it's hydrogenetically. To treat the cause, we need to deliver the patient preterm. In abruption, we need to deliver the patient to control the bleeding. When the rupture of membrane takes place, we cannot really continue the pregnancy because there is always a fear of infection. Multiple pregnancies, as I've already said, then intrauterine death of the fetus, congenital malformations, placenta previa, and placental abruption. These are again the causes of preterm labor. In investigation, this is a very specific and many questions are again asked on fibronectin. This is a investigative or this is a diagnostic test for preterm labor. Fetal fibronectin is a glycoprotein which binds fetal membranes to the decidua. It is normally found in the vaginal discharge before 22 weeks and then after 37 weeks. So if around 37 weeks or before completed 37 weeks, if we see fibronectin present in the vaginal discharge, then it is a strong indicator that this patient is likely to land up in preterm labor. Why this is important? Because if from history, from examination, from such marker, if we come to know that she is likely to go in preterm labor and then we take care of her in advance, we can still stop her from landing up in preterm labor. That is why these all things are very important clinically. Fibronectin levels more than 50 nanogram per ml, cervical length less than 2.5 cm on transvaginal sonography, Y-shaped suspicious Y-shaped funneling of the internal os, it suggests that yes, she is likely to go. If the internal os is U-shaped, then it is declared as incomplete, incompetent os or she is already in preterm labor. Again, these things are important from MCQ point of view. Y shape means it should be closed actually, the internal should be closed. When it starts opening up partially, the funneling, it suggests that she is likely to go. U is, it's completely open. So this is, she, the os is either incompetent, the internal os has opened up, the only the external os is closed, that's why the cervix, the os is appearing U shaped. So incompetent os or she is very close to preterm labor. Other investigations, hemogram, urine, routine and microscopy that tells us about infection. We can also send cervicovaginal swab to do the microscopic examination and give antibiotics accordingly. Ultrasound, it's useful for fetal monitoring, cervical length and also gives information about placental localization. Blood glucose levels are also important because if the patient is diabetic, she is more likely to have these infections. Again, if she is diabetic, then while giving tocolytics, we can be more careful. How to manage preterm labor? We can either avoid preterm labor or if patient comes in preterm labor, then we have to manage it till the corticosteroids act. Prophylactic management, 
we should have every patient walking into our antenatal clinics in the history if you have any factors which are suggestive of preterm labor means anything which suggests that she is likely to land up in preterm labor we should give more attention to that previous history if she is a smoker she takes alcohol she is a working lady strenuous work she is doing or any factor which suggests that she is likely to have preterm labor we should concentrate on that and provide care so that she shouldn't land up in preterm labor if diseases like pih diabetes are well controlled then naturally the further consequences like eclampsia are avoided and thus preterm labor can be avoided if from the history we come to know that this patient may have incompetent os or incompetent cervix then in time if we put the cervical encephalas stitch that will avoid preterm labor diabetes if well controlled on diet and with drugs naturally it will not have polyadrenalness or infections and thus we can avoid preterm labor if with the slightest of symptoms or before the established preterm labor we diagnose it and start her on topolytic therapy and rest we can avoid going in late preterm labor and thus the further consequences prophylactic cervical encephalage what is the role in avoiding preterm labor as we have discussed cervicalage can be of two types macdonalds and schrodkers in which patients patients with history of two or more mid trimester abortions mid trimester or late mid trimester abortions are ideal candidates for cervical encephalage it is best done at 14 weeks or 2 weeks earlier than the lowest period of vestige or may be as early as 10 weeks painless cervical dilatation is very much suggestive of incompetent os and on transvaginal sonography if the cervix is short and funneling is seen then it confirms the diagnosis and putting a stitch in time will save that pregnancy from preterm labor how to arrest preterm labor if in the opd patient has the symptoms you have examined her and all the findings are directing us towards preterm labor immediately hospitalize the patient bed rest and adequate hydration we should maintain and our whole aim is to give her corticosteroid therapy now the aim of the corticosteroid therapy is to enhance lung maturity and till this corticosteroid therapy works we have to give her tocolytic therapy so that she doesn't deliver so hospitalization bed rest corticosteroid therapy antibiotics to avoid or to control infections if present and tocolytic medications so as to avoid or so as to buy time till the corticosteroids act steroids are very important feature or fact of treatment for preterm labor they are in two forms betamethasone and dexamethasone betamethasone is to be given 12 mg intramuscularly with a gap of 24 hours two doses and dexa is to be given 6 mg intramuscularly 12 hourly four doses action it reduces respiratory distress syndrome because it enhances the surfactant formation also decreases the chances of intraventricular hemorrhage and necrotizing enterocolitis in mother relative contraindications are uncontrolled diabetes severe preeclampsia thyrotoxicosis and abruption in these cases we think twice before going for steroid therapy some are urgent like abruption we don't have time till the steroids work in diabetes we can increase the insulin dose and still give steroids preeclampsia if we have time giving steroids would work fetal indications like if there is acute fetal distress we cannot keep waiting for steroids to act in case of iod there is no indication congenital malformations again we don't give steroids pregnancy more than 34 weeks there is no indication for giving steroids 
So from 34 to 37 weeks, we can avoid giving steroids. Other indications, if there is PROM, rupture of membranes, this is a debatable issue. Some prefer to give steroids. Some say there is no need because it may increase the chances of infection. But along with antibiotics, we can still give steroids if there is no clinical evidence of chorioamnitis. But in case if the infection is already set in, there is chorioamnitis, then steroids are not to be given. Cervical dilatation more than 4 cm is again an contraindication for giving steroids because we don't have that much time so as the steroids will act. She is more than 4 cm, she is likely to deliver in maybe in 6 or 8 hours. So in that case, it would be of very less use. So we are planning, we want to give steroids to avoid those consequences. And when steroids are acting, we want to buy that time with the help of tocolytics. The pregnancy should continue at least for those 48 hours when the steroids are acting. So, candidates are, if there is no contraindication to the tocolytic drugs, we should give healthy and live fetus. IUD we should not. If there is any congenital malformation, no scope for tocolytics. If the fetus is in distress, there is no scope for tocolysis. We have to immediately deliver that fetus. Cervix, less than 4 cm dilated. Means we still feel that if we give tocolytic treatment, we will buy the 48 hours where steroids will act. And if the gestational age is from 24 to 34 weeks, we would like to give tocolysis. What are the tocolytic drugs? Nephidepine, beta sympathomimetics like ritodrin, atosiban, which is a oxytocin antagonist, magnesium sulfate, endomethacin, which is postagandin synthetase inhibitor, Isox supreme hydrochloride and progesterone. Now there can be an MCQ that which will be drug of choice. So the first line tocolytic or drug of choice for tocolysis is nephidipine. It's a calcium channel blocker and it has least side effects. That's why it's the preferred one. But it still has some side effects. But compa compared to other drugs, it has least side effects. Beta sympathomimetics, ritodrine and turbitalin, they have maximum side effects. Progesterone, role in prevention of miscarriage and preterm is not yet established completely. But still clinically, progesterone is given rampantly to avoid or to treat preterm labor. Now what are the doses? Nephidepine, 10 to 20 mg orally, every 6 to 8 hourly we can give. There are less side effects, whatever are headache, hypotension, flushing, fetal, there are not much of side effects seen. Retodrin, we can give it as an infusion if, the, if she is having contractions and then shift her on intramuscular. So infusion is 50 microgram per minute IV infusion, increased by 50 microgram every 10 minutes, maximum 350 microgram per minute for 12 hours after the contraction cease and then gradually we can taper it off. Side effects, they are very important. It causes tachycardia, hypotension and pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema is very commonly seen and we should be very careful. We should always keep a watch, do the RS examination to rule out that patient doesn't land up in pulmonary edema. There can be hyperglycemia because of beta mimetics and it can also lead to arrhythmias. In fetus, they can cause tachycardia, hyperglycemia and they also can have risk of IVH that is intraventricular hemorrhage. What are the contraindications for tocolysis? Infection, chorioamnitis. When there is infection set in, we are not supposed to give any tocolytics. Preeclampsia, eclampsia, delivery is must because that is a treatment. Abruption, patient is bleeding, so no time for tocolysis. Intrauterine death, congenitally malformed fetus, fetal distress, very severe IUGR and advanced labor. So again MCQs are there, very commonly asked what are the uh, contraindications. 
and in which some other contraindications would be there and IUD would be there. So you have to select that in IUD, we will not go for tocolysis. Delivery. What precaution or management will do during delivery? Continuous monitoring of the fetus because it's a preterm fetus, doesn't have that maturity, can land up in distress or asphyxia very commonly. So we have to monitor the fetus, mode of delivery, vaginally is that, that mode is preferred. Caesarean section is not indicated routinely. The only indication for caesarean section in preterm is less than 34 weeks baby with breech presentation. In that case, when the after coming head we have to deliver in breech, that will lead to intraventricular hemorrhage. So we want to avoid that compression and sudden decompression of the after coming head and thus we would like to deliver that baby for by C-section for better prognosis. Usually the lower segment is not formed at this gestation age. So we have to take either a vertical or J-shaped incision on the lower uterine segment. Routinely forceps are not indicated but wherever indicated they can be used as they avoid compression of the fetal head. So over here we have concluded with preterm. Now let's see the other entity that is pre-labor rupture of membranes or it was initially called as premature rupture of membranes, PROM. The definition is spontaneous rupture of membranes anytime beyond 28 weeks but before the onset of labor. Usually membranes rupture either in late first stage, that means the cervical dilatation is around 5, 6, 7, 8 centimeter or maybe in second stage. But here, it membranes are rupturing beyond 28 weeks but before the onset of labor. Incidence is again 10% of all pregnancies. If the membranes rupture after 37 weeks but before onset of labor, it is called as term PROM. If membranes rupture before 37 completed weeks, it is called as preterm PROM. And if the rupture of membrane is for more than 24 hours before delivery, then it is called as prolonged rupture of membranes. Causes. Most common cause, infections. Chlamydia, trachomatis, beta streptococci, bacterial vaginosis, all these infections are common, commonly seen in genital tract. These bacterial infections, these bacteria, they release proteases, these enzymes. They weaken the membrane, tensile strength is lost and very easily the membranes can be ruptured or broken and thus allowing the amniotic fluid to drain out. Multiple pregnancies, distension or opens up ascending infection or the pressure of multiple gestation can lead to PRM. Incompetent cervix and PROM they go hand in hand. Os is open, ascending infection, again very high chances. Polyhydramnus. Polyhydramnus and multiple pregnancy have the pressure effects and thus leading to PROM. Previous history of PROM is a risk factor and in such patients PROM will be seen again if it was present before. How the patient would present? Sudden escape of watery discharge per vaginum. It can be a gush of fluid or it can be fluid coming slowly that is called as leaking. That she experiences, she is either sitting or doing some activity and suddenly she experiences some discharge which is watery. Ideally she explains it in a way that she stands up and the discharge flows over her thighs. So it is much more than any cervical or vaginal discharge watery either in gush or it will keep coming in bites time after time. On PV examination, per speculum examination we can see the liquor coming out of the os. Litmus paper test or nitrogen paper test, the pH changes so the paper changes from yellow to blue. Ferning pattern would be seen in presence of amniotic fluid leaking. Nile blue sulfate, orange blue discoloration of the cells would be seen and on ultrasound 
we will find that the liquor is decreased. Investigations to be sent are full blood count, urine, routine and microscopy. We can send high vaginal swab for culture. Ultrasound should be done for fetal biophysical profile and mainly the liquor quantity because prognosis of the fetus, how the fetus would behave in labor, it all depends on the quantity of liquor which is remaining in the uterine cavity. And cardiotopography to be used to detect fetal distress as early as possible. Dangers, ascending infection and setting up of chorioamnonitis. There can be cord prolapse because when in polyhydramnus suddenly membranes burst and liquor flows along with that cord can come out suddenly and that can lead to even fetal death. So it's an obstetric emergency again and we should always think of this entity when we are dealing with polyhydramnus that PRM can take place and cord can get prolapsed. If the liquor just gets drained out, it will lead to dry labor. Placental abruption can be there because suddenly the cavity has decreased in size as the liquor has drained out. If it happens in early gestation, it can lead to fetal pulmonary hypoplasia because lungs to grow they need space. Liquor gives that space in the uterine cavity. If liquor has drained out, usually there is hampered lung growth and fetus have pulmonary hypoplasia then leading to pulmonary hypertension. Neonatal sepsis, RDS, IVH, NAC all are seen because once membrane rupture then naturally she is going to progress in labor and preterm delivery would be there. So it increases perinatal morbidities including cerebral palsy. Management, if the pregnancy is less than 34 weeks then we can have expectant management under antibiotic cover so as to avoid chorioamnionitis till the fetal maturity. If the fetus is more than 34 weeks, some say wait for spontaneous labor, but some say immediately start augmentation of the labor, induction with oxytocin or prostaglandins and deliver the patient under antibiotic cover. If the pregnancy is more than 37 weeks, again if the bishops is good, we can immediately augment and induce the labor and if it's bad then we can wait for 24 hours under antibiotic cover for spontaneous labor. Antibiotics, prophylactic or to minimize maternal and perinatal risk of infection. Preferred antibiotics are ampicillin, amoxicillin, erythromycin, IV or for 48 hours. Use of cortico corticosteroid is controversial. But if there is no evidence of chorioamnitis, we can give it under the cover of antibiotics. PROM may accelerate lung maturity, but again it is doubtful.